our discussion of magnetic fields. And we'll start today with some consequences of magnetic forces. And the first topic that we'll discuss is the Hall effect. And so if I have a picture here, and we'll say that current is flowing in this direction in both pictures. And so this is, these are just two different wires. And if we have a magnetic field, let's say it's that the magnetic field is coming out of the board. In both cases, then if we look at the direction of the velocity, so this top wire will be if moving charges are positive. And the velocity is this direction. And then if moving charges are negative, And so we know that the current and the velocity are different directions from when we talked about drift velocity earlier in the semester. Uh, but let's assume that we don't know that. And uh, basically this experiment is the one that you would conduct to determine which sign of charge is responsible for moving throughout the, the circuit. So we'll assume that the velocity is in the same direction as the current. And in the top wire, when you do your right-hand rule, you would have velocity to the right, magnetic field pointing out at you. So you would get a force that's pointed downward. So there would be magnetic force in the wire pointing down. If you do the same right-hand rule uh, in the bottom picture, but now the charges are negative, you have to flip the direction of the force. So now, the bottom picture, your magnetic force would be pointed upward. So what is going to happen is that Uh, if we look at the top picture, if the magnetic force is pushing all of the moving charges to the bottom, we'll have a bunch of positive charges down here. 
and you'll have a lack of positive charges at the top. So it would either be neutral or it would be negatively charged. And then in the bottom picture, it's just uh, So if we are defining the current as the positive charges moving to the right, then the velocity would have to be this way in the bottom picture. And that would mean that the force is also pointing down. And so on the bottom picture, then you've got your negative charges at the bottom and your positive charges at the top. So that's if we wanted the charges to separate, but these charges are already separate. So what we can do is measure this voltage And if the voltage is one sign, then it would be, it would mean that the positive charges are the ones moving. And if it's the negative of that, then it would mean that the negative charges are the ones moving. So basically the Hall effect is that when you have charges moving in a wire and you put a magnetic field or you put that wire in a magnetic field, then you're gonna cause some of the charges to be at the bottom of the wire and some at the top of the wire. We can use that to then determine which charges are moving through our wire. And when you do this experiment, you find that the, it is the negative charges that are the ones moving and not the positive charges. So this is the, the way that we know that negative charges are the ones that are moving. And to do that, we're just doing this QV cross V equation. So this is conceptually what that looks like. And then if you want to write down the equation, if we look at the picture that we had, there are, there's a separation of charge. So there's going to be some kind of electric force And then we saw that there was a, if there's particles moving in this direction, I guess it was the other way, because they were negative. You have negative charges moving in this direction and a magnetic field pointing out. then you get a magnetic force that's pointing to 
Let's look down. Then we have two forces that can balance each other out. Magnetic force and electric force. The magnetic force is QV cross B. The electric force is Q times E. Oh, and so I guess but let me back up a sec. So the reason that the, so if you think about the electric field, the electric field is going to point. This way, right? Because your electric field lines start at positive and then go outward and then they go inward towards the negative charges. So this is why the electric field would point down. But then we determined that the negative charges were the ones that are moving. And so the force would be in the opposite direction because the charge uh, is negative. So the force that that particle would feel would point upward. So that's why the electric force is pointing up. And we already determined that the magnetic force was pointing down with the right hand rule. And so if we, Look at this equation now, we can cancel out our charges because it's the same charge. Uh, v and B are, are perpendicular, so we can just simplify it like this. The electric field, uh, we can replace with voltage over delta X or in this case of Y. And I guess I'll keep writing the, the vector on top of the lowercase v, just so you know that it's velocity. And then the v without a vector is the voltage. So if you wanted to know the voltage, you could solve this equation and you would get something like this. So in effect, if you, if you know everything on the right-hand side, like the magnetic field, the thickness of your wire, delta Y, and the velocity of the charges moving, then you would know what voltage uh, that you're gonna measure. Or conversely, you might know the voltage just by reading it off of your uh, whatever voltmeter. You would know the thickness of your wire. You know what magnetic field you're producing. And so you could calculate the velocity of the charges that are moving using this equation. And so this is one way that we can figure out what the drift velocity of the particles that are moving in our wire. So this one experiment, the Hall effect, can tell us the sign of the charges that are moving, whether they're positive or negative. And then we can also use it to measure the drift velocity of the particles. The, so you know why the electric field points down, right? And so remember the electric field points 
in the direction that a positive charge would move. And so because we've determined that it's negative charges that are moving, then the, the negative charges would move in the opposite direction of the electric field. And the thing that causes something to move is a force. So that's why the electric force is upward. And mathematically, it's that this is the equation for the electric force. And so if you put a negative sign on the Q, then it would just flip the direction. So if, if Q is positive, then force and electric field are in the same direction. But if you have a negative sign on the Q, then force and electric field have to be in opposite directions. Uh, so we'll move on to another application of the magnetic force. And this is something that we saw on the homework. So magnetic forces can cause circular motion. So this is the equation for magnetic force. And we saw that if the, or maybe I'll, I'll show it now. If we start, let's say that the velocity is this direction, and we'll just say it's positive for now. And then we have a magnetic field coming out of the board. I guess we'll do it going into the board instead. So if you do your right hand rule with this, you get a force that points upward, right? So so now if we made a kind of a path for the particle, And because of that force, eventually we're going to end up over here. And now we have a voltage that's, or not a voltage, a velocity that's upward. So again, if you do your right hand rule, velocity points upward, the magnetic field is into the board, then you get a force that points to the left. So magnetic force is now this direction. So again, that's gonna cause your particle to have a curved path. Now the velocity is to the left. Magnetic force is still into the board. So your right hand rule tells you that the force is now pointing downward. So again, that's gonna make your particle go on the dotted path. Now your velocity is downward, the magnetic force is into the board. So your right-hand rule tells you that you get a force pointing to the right. And then if you do that dotted path, you'll see that you end up 
where we start. So a particle moving at some velocity in a magnetic field can make the particle do circular motion. And if we remember from physics one, the force of something moving in a circle is due to the centripetal acceleration. And the centripetal acceleration has this equation. So this is force, mass, and centripetal acceleration. The equation for the centripetal acceleration is Vt squared over R. Vt is the tangential velocity. R is the radius of the circle. And so if we set the magnetic force equal to the centripetal acceleration, then we get the following. squared over r. So we'll just assume that the velocity and the magnetic field are at right angles. So we can simplify this. You can cross out one of your velocities. And let's say, for example, you wanted to solve for the radius of the circle. You would get that the radius is QB over M B. So let's say you knew the charge and the mass of some particle, you shoot it off at some velocity in some magnetic field, then the radius that that object would orbit in would be given by this equation. Or uh, the other practical application of this is, let's say we wanted to solve for Q over M, then we would have RV over B. Q over M is called the charge mass ratio. And when we were first doing experiments about trying to figure out what charges are moving and how big are they, what charge do they have, this was the first step uh, in doing that. So Using this, you would need some other equation to solve for either the mass or the charge of the object, uh, but this is a, a good first step. And so this is the first step in us learning how or what the charge of an electron is, which we now know is the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and the mass of the electron, which is like 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So you just shoot an electron at some known velocity. You put it in a magnetic field that you know you control the strength of. And if you measure the radius of the orbit, then you can, you can calculate the charge to mass ratio of that particle. So this had big implications in the beginning of 
learning about electricity and magnetism. And then it also has applications today in like mass, spectrom mass spectrometers. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. What we've done so far is just the force that a single particle would feel if it's moving at some velocity in a magnetic field. Uh, but in most of the things that we do, we don't have just a single particle moving. We have a lot of particles moving, say like a current in a wire. So we'll look at now the force on a current carrying wire. So if this is our wire, And we'll say that the current is moving in this direction. And we know that current moving to the right means negative particles are moving to the left, but we'll just uh, ignore that for now. It's not going to change the math for this. And let's say we put a magnetic field, let's say coming out of the board. Then let's pretend that a positive charge is moving to the right at some velocity v. Which is basically what a current moving to the right means. If we looked at just this single particle, we would have force equals q B cross B. But remember, in a current carrying wire, there are a lot of these particles that are moving. And so if we take this force and multiply it by N, then we'll have the total force on the wire. So this is the number of, I guess, charged particles moving in the wire. So we just took our regular magnetic force equation and multiplied it by however many charges are moving. So if we remember back to when we talked about drift velocity, we saw that the velocity of the charges moving was given by this equation, current over charge times the cross-sectional area times lowercase n. So this, I'll write down what all these variables mean. Drift velocity, current, charge, cross-sectional area, And lowercase n was the number density of the charged particles. And so little n is just some number of charged particles divided by the volume.
So if we look at our equation, we have a charge and a velocity. And if we rearrange our drift velocity equation, we can have a charge and a velocity together. So now we're gonna take this drift velocity equation and plug it into that force equation that we had. So now our magnetic force equals I over A N cross B times N. Now I'm going to replace the little n with capital N divided by volume. And if you wanna keep track of the vectors, then technically the cross-sectional area and now the volume are vectors. And you need to have a vector on the left-hand side in order for a cross product to work. So now the capital N's can cancel. And now if we look at the area divided by the volume, uh, and this will be true uh, no matter what the, the shape of your wire is, but let's just assume that it's a cylinder for now. Then the cross-sectional area is just pi r squared. The, the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared L. So you can cross out the pi r squared part and you get that the area divided by the volume is one over length. So if we replace that in our denominator, now we have one over L cross B. And one over, dividing by one over something is the same time thing as just multiplying by that thing. And so you get the force on a current carrying wire is just I L cross B. So this is still a cross product. So your right-hand rule will still apply. 